Well, that was delightfully carefully crafted, I think, and detailed in its argumentation. I'm, uh, you know, it's always a problem following Heidi on these things. But I'll put it in my own words, so I'll sound different, even if I'm going to say a lot of the same things. I'm not at her point where she said to George that I'm not morally motivated yet. I don't know whether Randy's paper morally motivates me, because at the bottom line, if you can't stand the suspense of where these comments are going to go, at the bottom line, I don't think he's told us enough, despite the detail and the clarity with which he's gone as far as he has. Let me stand back, because it's easy when you see this many particular trees to miss the forest. What's the forest? First question, what's the issue to which his paper and George's actually are both contributions? The issue, as they put it, is unwitting omission. So I saw Randy's title when I got the paper, and I said, God, it could be about any of three topics. It could be about the problem of omissions constituting wrongdoing because of the fact that with an omission, there isn't an action. It's not a particular, the bogus entities. You can't have calls or relations. Can you have counterfactual relations? And away we go with a familiar litany of issues. The second thing I said it could be about is focusing not on the omission, but on the unwitting part. It's about the problem of inadvertence. If the actor's mind is not focused on the wrong-making aspects of his action or the need for action at all in the case of omissions, is he nonetheless culpable and therefore blameworthy? Or, most interesting, I thought, could be number three, a combination of the two. That somehow the slippage with regard to making someone blameworthy for omissions would impact on the inadvertence that otherwise wouldn't make you culpable but might for omissions. Um, I do think plainly the paper is the first of the topics and not the second and the third. So I take the question to be the general question of negligence. And the act-omission distinction drops out as inessential. Namely, the question is whether or not for an act you should do or an act you shouldn't do, positive and negative obligations. When you don't advert to what makes it either obligatory to do it, the positive obligation, or that has an action you are doing have the aspect that makes it wrongful and therefore you have an obligation not to do it. The real question is the cognitive condition about are you blameworthy for not adverting to that which should have alerted you of the need to do a different action or to do an action at all. So I think the general question is one of negligence, which isn't to say it's inappropriate, it's perfectly appropriate for this conference, but it's broader than just omissions. Once you see that second point, there's really, and this is repeating Heidi, there's really only three positions in the literature. There are the skeptics, of which I see many of my friends out there, um, who think the answer to that is just a no, in which we don't have to engage in these elaborate searches for how can you be blameworthy for inadvertent um, causing of harm or failing to prevent harm. Uh, the skeptics don't have to be morally obtuse. We skeptics can trace just as well as anybody else to find culpable choices. Heidi and I have an archipelago, as we call it, of seven or eight ways in which you can blame someone calling it negligence when really what you can find is a culpable choice. I remember an old colleague of ours up at Chicago said, well, is it seven or eight? And I said, well, you've written joint papers before, Eric. I think it's seven. She thinks it's eight. So we said seven or eight. But anyway, there's a, a lot of conditions where you can blame people. But I think Randy rightly focuses on putting that away and saying, no, get rid of all of that. Get rid of that kind of erotic blameworthiness for some people who just are ill-formed. They're badly stamped out can openers. Put away the erotic blameworthiness. We're talking about real blameworthiness for an omission or you want to, for an action that has consequences you didn't anticipate. Um, that's the non-skeptical position that he looks like he's defending. Now, this, the second position, I said they're skeptics. There are people who are character theorists. Descending from Hume on down, the real locus of blame is for bad character, and the question is whether an act or an omission expresses that character in certain ways. In the case of inadvertent admissions, that leads directly to what George was talking about, Randy was talking about, the people who believe you're blameworthy because what explains why you didn't advert is because you don't care about people, or you have some other basic moral defect in your makeup. Those are easy cases to see a kind of blame, but notice neither George nor Randy want to associate themselves with those views. Third view, the incapacity view. I'm sure it antedates Herbert Hart, but in the 1950s, Hart said the following. If you're obligated to do something, you should do it. And you could do that thing, but you don't. 
in which event you're blameworthy for unexercised capacity without regard to choice. And indeed, chosen wrongdoing is just but a special case of where you had the capacity to do other than you did. You didn't exercise the capacity. You should have. You're blameworthy. I call that the unexercised capacity view. If you have a paper called the ability view, then I think quite squarely you think, well, Randy must be a capacity guy. Where George is is a different question. That's, George wants a fourth view, and I think that's the, the hard one to find. But Randy looks like the third in capacity. The reason I go into that is because of this section eight, which really irritated me when I got to it. Because I thought, come on, Randy, be a man. Stand up and defend your views about punishable blameworthiness, responsibility. Don't go off with Bernard Williams, agent regret, and secondary duties of compensation and apology. Be a red-blooded retributor. Just punish the bastards. So I want Randy to actually think what he could have thought on my analysis of could, which is in a very close possible world, this is what he would have thought. He would have thought that if you had, like Hart, an unexercised capacity, then you're blameworthy for the failure of its exercise. That's what I would like to have seen. Um, so I'm going to construe the Randy I'm talking about as this other guy. He's his doppelganger in Twin Earth that's really close. Um, OK, what's the capacity view? Randy, I think, has three things he does that are helpful. Start out with the general view that if there's duty and ability and failure, you prima facie look blameworthy. That's surely intuitive. You could have, you should have, you didn't, you're blameworthy. That looks pretty intuitive. He then says, well, but we've got to be careful about what could means, because if you take could to mean capacity in a general sense, it looks insufficient. So he adds in, although I'm unclear as to how he combines or distinguishes these two, to capacity he adds in opportunity to exercise your capacities. And he adds in a lack of a situation that masks the capacity you would otherwise have had. It looks like perhaps a triad of capacity, opportunity, and lack of masking situation, which amounts to an excuse. I don't quite care how that's packaged. At the end of the day, he does get to, I think, Austin's all-in sense of could. Namely, it's not a general capacity. It's what people for 50 years often call particular capacity. Not whether, in Austin's case, could you, in general, make a golf putt of that level of difficulty. It's rather, could you have made that putt, the one you missed? That's what we're really interested in when we're asking about capacities and ability for the capacity view to be plausible. You can sub-package that particular capacity as a general capacity plus an ability plus the lack of a masking situation, or you can just do it more generally like many people have done. So I do think the subdivision is necessary, or at least its analog in particular capacities is. I think the third thing Randy does is also necessary. It is the case you need to say to yourself, with regard to inadvertent harm causing or inadvertent harm prevention, could you have adverted? It's also true you have to have what he calls the control condition. It also has to be the case that had you adverted and tried to do the thing you saw you needed to do, could you have done it? And if there's no milk at the stores, you're quite right. You do not have the capacity to have done what you needed to do, what you're obligated to do. And that is in and of itself relieving of responsibility. So we do need the control condition, but that's not what's problematic about the incapacity cases where you're inadvertent. It's the cognitive condition. Could you have advertent when it adverted to either the need to act in the case of omissions or to the wrong-making characteristics in the case of actions? Could you have adverted when, in fact, you didn't? And here's where I get in trouble. I don't know what he means by could. I don't know what he means by can. And without some guidance, I'm kind of bereft of intuitions. So in this case, which he elaborates on the outline slightly from the paper, Williams' lorry driver, vis-a-vis -vis the parent who forgets her child in the car, he's confident the lorry driver couldn't have not killed the kid, confident the patient, the parent, could have saved her child. He's confident the lorry driver couldn't have adverted to the means by which he might have avoided killing the kid, confident that the parent could. I don't know about you. I am bereft of intuitions until someone tells me more about what they mean by could. He alludes at one point to the indeterminate sense of could. Well, in the indeterminate sense of could, you can only do things of which you're literally free of sufficient causation in the causation of your actions to do them under determinist 
deterministic assumptions, those distinctions won't wash at all. Nobody can do anything other than what they actually do or think anything but what they actually think. So he needs to put aside the indeterminist possibility, at least for us determinists. Uh, he has to have an analysis of could. Now, if you're a primitivist, like some people, Mumford, the late George Molnar, and others, that's all well and good. But as I once said to Stephen Mumford, you're a primitivist who says an awful lot about what capacity means. And you need to. Because otherwise, I don't know how to resolve these kinds of cases. So here's what I do. When I read the paper, I say, OK, what if you plug in the view of capacity that, say, Michael Moore holds with a bunch of other people? namely the old conditionalist analysis that says these are all disguised counterfactual conditionals. So that if you're talking about what someone can do, you're talking about what they would do in a world close to the actual world but differing in some morally relevant way. We do that with regard to chosen choices. What would be the analog with regard to inadvertent choices? Now the standard analysis for intentional omissions going back to 1912, G.E. Moore, is he could have done otherwise if he would have done otherwise if he had chosen. It takes a lot of fancy footwork to make that due service, I think, for intentional omissions. But suppose one does that. The question is, what about inadvertence? What fills in the conditions that change from the actual world in which you would succeed at whatever you had the ability to do? Here, you would succeed at adverting if what? And here's the danger. The danger is that in context, lots of things can be conditions. But in the context of blaming people, only things that have moral salience offer themselves up as plausible instantiations of what has to change when you're testing whether someone has an ability. And the thing that leaps to the mind when you say, well, let's see, he would have adverted if, what would be morally relevant? If he cared enough about people, that looks more morally relevant. But all of a sudden, you're playing the character game, the second rather than the first. And the incapacity view of blameworthiness for inadvertent admissions simply drops in to the character view. What would be other candidates? Well, think of the, all the things you might mean. Trackstar loses his race. You say you could have won the race. You could mean you would have won if you tried harder. You could mean you would have won if you kept your head down, could have won all sorts of things that you're fault. You could have won if the wind hadn't been against you as it wasn't in the other lanes. You could have won if the track had been a slightly different surface. There are lots of conditionals, some relevant to blame, some not. But even within the blame game, there's some indeterminacy. Until I hear the translation, I don't have a clue. I can say the lorry driver could, of course, have not killed the kid. All he had to do was drive a little slower. Uh, he wouldn't have been where the kid came out. He could have adverted to that fact. Uh, he could have said to himself, if I drive a little differently, it might be the case I might not hit a kid. Or you could have the opposite conclusion. He could not. Until you tell us what could is, I don't have intuitions about these cases. The same for the parent. Take one of Michael Smith's examples. The parent can't advert, he says, because she's thinking about it and he's got some obsessive thought. Well, OK, maybe yes, maybe not. I don't know what even Randy thinks about that kind of case. Maybe that's one of those excusing situations. That means although you have the general capacity, on this case, you either had not the opportunity or your situation was such that it masks the ability you normally have. But I don't know until he tells us what he thinks ability in general is, and thus what masks are. So uh, a comment that actually doesn't disagree, it just says, what do you mean? Thanks. So thanks. Um, we'll now have some time for discussion. And he'll give a reply as well for five minutes. Yeah, just very brief, because I, I want uh, to leave as much time for discussion as possible. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, um, um, it's a, a very um, uh, charitable reading and uh, good explication of the thing. Um, yeah, and I agree with everything except the end. Um, um, so, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think we do have, you know, so it's a part of our ordinary understanding of our agency that, that we have abilities uh, to do this and that, uh, th and our ordinary understanding of ourselves, that we have psychological capacities of various sorts. And then we have some ideas of things that um, remove or, or limit these. Um, and, and then there's some philosophical arguments to the effect, well, that certain general conditions would 
uh, would uh, eliminate uh, them. Uh, but th those philosophical arguments are not part of common sense, and unless those philosophical arguments are very good, I think you know we are um, in good shape sticking with common sense and um, our beliefs about what people have capacities to do. Um, an analysis of it, well, so I mean, I think I, I, I think we do understand what we're saying there. Uh, yeah, it'd be great to have an analysis of can claims, um, but I'm. I don't know of any successful analyses of any really interesting philosophical notions. Um, don't say they're impossible, but um, they're um, kind of hard to come by. So illumination, saying more about what capacities are, sure, I, I, I think that can be done. But, yeah, it's a good project. So yeah, um, we're doing the indicating that we're <coughs> Yeah, so I'm Carolina Sartorio. Uh, so just more on that issue, I guess. Um, well, the main thing I wanted to ask you is, um, it sounded like you were trying to give an account of control in terms of can and all of that, and then there was all this talk about reasonable expectations. Now, it also sounded like the account in terms of can and control isn't really doing the work, given your answer to Michael's comments. Um, I think what you're trying to say is that it would not be reasonable to expect the lorry driver to have done something different. Of course, there are possible worlds, in fact, perhaps nearby possible worlds where he does something different. Right at the last minute, he decides to turn right instead of left, and as a result of that, he doesn't ride over a child, right? Um, so what is the difference between the lorry driver and you're forgetting about the milk, it's something having to do with reasonable expectations. Is that what you're trying to say? And if so, it, it doesn't sound like you have a, an independent account in terms of abilities. It's not really an ability account in the deepest metaphysical sense, but your intuitions about abil abilities are driven by intuitions about reasonable expectations. I mean, I do think so. What it's reasonable to expect of somebody is in partly dependent on what they can do, um, but it's also partly dependent on uh, what their obligations are. Um, so, you know, given the obligations of a driver, uh, the lorry drive, and, and given the lorry driver's capacities, the lorry driver, uh, you know, I suppose let's imagine the kid darts out from behind a fence. He can't see through fences, um, and he's driving in a. Um, um, a, a safe fashion. Um, so, um, so I, I mean, I think. Uh, so I mean, so yeah. Uh, I mean, there is an appeal to abilities and capacities, and they do figure in what it is reasonable to expect. Um, but they're playing. I mean, that appeal is playing an independent role. Um, and I don't. I don't offer an account uh, or an analysis of what abilities or capacities are. But um, they're. Does, does that make? Is that, does that answer the question? Um, no. But I mean, you're not saying something like in the milk case, the possible world is closer to the real world than in the other case. So what's the difference between the cases? Um, it seems like it's just, well, there's an obligation in one case, there's not an obligation in the other. There's a reasonable expectation in one case, there's not a reasonable expectation in the other. Yeah. What so, are the metaphysical difference between uh -huh. Um, well, okay, so um, uh, I think, you know, most of us can remember um, to do the things that we have only recently promised to do. Um, right. um, and, you know, given that, it, it's generally reasonable to expect us to do, to remember that. Um, so that's the, that's the claim that's made there. Um, now, most of us can't see through fences, and um, so can't see children behind fences. and. Be, it's kind of unreasonable to expect the lorry driver to have seen that. Um, I think we're not disagreeing. I think you're agreeing with what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> you're um, saying it's an account of ability that is driven by reasonable expectations in the space of the standards. Or... 
something along those lines? Uh, well, it's um, it's an account of blame. It's an account of blameworthiness. So um, uh, some claims about what is reasonable to expect of people uh, plays a role in in the account, um, and some claims about what capacities and, and abilities agents have plays a role in it. And that also, uh, and and the, uh, the 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 ideas that what capacities and abilities people have figure. Uh, are among the determinants of what it's reasonable to expect them to do. Yeah, okay. So. Thank you. I'm Matt Talbert. Um, it's on? Okay. Um, when you talk about blame, you're talking about blame in a full-blooded sense. Uh, so resentment would be appropriate. Negative reactive attitudes would be on the table, mm -hmm. I assume. Right. Can be, can be. Can, sure. But I'm wondering if, and this gets back to the issues that people were pressing George on. I'm wondering if you can say something th that would help to motivate or ground uh, these moralized uh, reactive attitudes. I mean, I get that there's been an unwelcome occurrence, and I get that that unwelcome occurrence can be causally traced to something that the agent did. It's sourced in them. It's a function of how they are. But without there being a kind of moral affront, uh, I don't see how you're going to get resentment, full-blooded blame off the ground. Uh -huh. And it seems that to, for this to be a moral affront, it needs to be, you need to say more than just that, well, it was unwelcome and it's sourced in you. Because we yeah. can think about cases like that where we can find an excuse. Yeah. Um, so let's see, it's not a moral affront that uh, you left the child in the car. Or that you, you left the stove on and the house burned down. Something. Um, so the so what I put that in terms of is uh, you know you you fail to manifest goodwill. Um, right. Uh, and that's one of the things. I mean, you know, I don't know how much weight to put on that that word that Strassen sometimes uses, but uh, it's uh, you know, and, and the claim isn't this is what Strassen meant. Um, I, I think that's But helped. it seems reasonable to to say that is part of our. Uh, the demand that's reflected in uh, the reactive attitudes that that people refrain from manifesting ill will sure. and manifest goodwill. And the moral affront is that on these occasions, the agent did not manifest goodwill. They had it, but they didn't manifest it. And they could have manifested it. I think that's and they've helpful. got no excuse for not manifesting it. Yeah, I think so. that's helpful. I mean, that, that does go some way towards answering my question. But I guess what I would say there is that the failure to manifest the goodwill needs itself to be explained by something that's independently uh, morally criticizable. And it may be that the failure to manifest isn't itself sourced in something that's independently bad or morally objectionable. Yeah, right. and, and if it were, I mean, if the reason I didn't manifest my good my goodwill, which I had the capacity to do that, but the reason I didn't is because I actually didn't care enough. Well, yeah. then I could see. But if it's just, uh -huh. it, was a, it was a glitch, as, as, as George said. I mean, if it's, if it's ultimately sourced in, yeah, things just didn't yeah. go right, right. in my uh, yeah. psychological mechanism. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I'd be reluctant. So what, what is a glitch? Um, um, I'm not sure. Something but, but, broke? Yeah, let's just um, let's so, say. I mean, if you put it that way, then it begins to sound like, well, he couldn't have done it on this occasion. He couldn't have thought of it on this occasion because something broke. And then I think you are letting him off the hook. Yeah, well, I think um, any and, account and, that where it doesn't happen is, and you want to say that he could have, I mean, there's got to be some explanation for why it didn't happen. Sure. And, and it can't right. be that, well, it was intentional or it was a manifestation of an independently right. objectionable right. attitude. Right. I mean, you can say that, but then I'll just so. agree and say, yeah, definitely right. blameworthy. But, so it looks like it's always going to be but, something a bit glitchy. But not many of our explanations of why something why somebody did something imply that they couldn't have done otherwise. I mean, you need more uh, to, uh, to get that implication. Um, so, um, and, I, and you know, so in the case where what explained it was, you know, the person was hypnotized or, uh, you know, the person is insane, um, you'd have an explanation uh, that might uh, imply an incapacity. Um, but many explanations of failure don't imply, don't so in such an, a clear way imply inc incapacity. And I'm suggesting that the explanation for the failure needs to implicate the agent in a way as as a um, 
um, as, as possessing bad, making faulty moral judgments, having bad attitudes. Right. Well. What's the argument for that? The, for that, that claim. That, that that's what blame requires? Yeah. The argument for the, because yeah. that's going to help us see why resentment is appropriate. I take it resentment tracks that sort of uh, state. So failure to manifest goodwill. I, not not, not necessarily. I mean, yeah. I can think of these failures yeah. to manifest. When one could. Just, and when one has no excuse for not. That are yeah. just, it's just one yeah. of the things that happen. Yeah. Just as you can forget yeah. something. You care yeah. about it very much. Um, there's no good explanation for why you forgot. But you just did forget. And it doesn't tell us anything about you as a moral agent. I at least think that's possible. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, number seven. Hi, Michael Zimmerman. Um, Randy, I'm wondering about the difference between the lorry driver and the parent. Um, you make three claims, um, two of which seem uh, dubious to me, uh, that the driver did nothing wrong, but the parent did. Uh, I guess that depends on a general account of wrongdoing, but it seems to me there are many accounts according to which the driver did do something wrong. Uh -huh. um, and whatever account might imply that the driver didn't do uh, something wrong, um, that might also imply that the parent didn't. Yeah. Um, and also with respect to what uh, each person could have avoided doing, uh, as, as Michael said, uh, it, it seems sensible to say that the driver could have avoided killing the child just by driving more slowly, although he had no perhaps no good reason to do that, or no reason that he was aware of. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that the main um, difference between them that I think it, you would want to emphasize is the claim that the driver couldn't reasonably have been expected to see the need to uh, act differently, whereas the parent could have. Mm -hmm. That seems to me to be where you want to hang your, 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 your view about the blameworthiness of the parent. Um, I guess I just have this question. Uh, to say that the driver, that, that the parent could reasonably have been expected to see the need to act differently is to say that the parent failed to meet some standard um, that the parent should have met. Um, but uh, that seems to me just to raise the question once again whether why we should blame the parent or whether we should blame the parent for not meeting that standard. Um, and if the parent, again, I, I know you, you have a view about this, I'd just like to hear more about it. If we don't say that the parent is blameworthy for not meeting the standard, uh, then why should we, um, excuse me, why should we say that the, the parent is blameworthy? Well, should we or should we not say that the, the parent is blameworthy for not meeting the standard? The, the parent didn't meet the standard not meeting the standard of, of adverting to the um, need to, to, to uh, not leave the child in the, in the car. Or, um, because you want to say that the parent is directly blameworthy for the omission. But I, as I understand it, you, you don't want to say, therefore, the, bl the blameworthiness for the omission is to be traced to blameworthiness to failing to meet the standard. But my question is, if the parent isn't blameworthy for failing to meet the standard, then why should we say that the, the parent is blameworthy for the omission? Yeah, yeah, good. Right. Yeah, so the idea is um, so the, the, the parent doesn't think to take the child from the car when, when the parent gets out at work, or earlier didn't think to you know, turn towards the daycare center. Anyway, anyway. Um, there's some failure of thought there. And the claim is that's a, something morally faulty. Uh, but uh, it might not be something the parent is blameworthy for. Um, and it's in your question, well, if not blameworthy for that, then why blameworthy for omitting to take the child from the, yeah. But, you know, I mean, generally, uh, if something like, um, what is it, uh, DR is correct, um, you, you, you can have bad attitudes for which you're not blameworthy um, that can um, uh, motivate actions for which you're blameworthy. So there can be, um, and you might be criticizable for having those bad attitudes. So here we've got a, um, a failure of thought for which you're criticizable but not blameworthy. 
um, which leads to the, the omission. Um, I mean, that's a, it seems to me that that's just a general feature that, um, you know, blameworthiness doesn't require this regress that, you know, if there's something that about you that, that leads to the blameworthy thing, then you must be blameworthy for that prior thing too. Um, so my, my view here is an instance of denying that kind of regress requirement. Right. Well, the, the regress must be denied uh, as a general requirement yeah. because then um, you would never have direct blameworthiness for anything. Yeah. Right. But, right. Um, but in this case, um, you're, you are in some sense tracing the blameworthiness for the omission to the failure to meet a certain standard. Um, uh, well, the, the failure uh, figures in the etiology of the omission. Yeah. Um, Right. So, would you be blameworthy if you, if they weren't for that? Is that is that the idea? If that weren't, they weren't that morally objectionable. Uh, right. I mean, yeah. that, that's part of the story, right? That yeah. It was reasonable to expect the parents to have adverted to the. Right. Um, let's see. I mean, I I can't see that you would be. So it looks like um, there has to be that kind of failure of thought in these cases. Um, in order for you to have blameworthiness for the omission. That failure of thought is something morally objectionable about the agent, but might be something for which the agent isn't blameworthy. So we've got about five minutes left and four people in the queue. So number 11 for now. Doug Husack. And this is a question I guess I could address to either Randy or Michael, similar question in different terms. So Michael said he was at sea with a lot of your examples and hypotheticals because, you know, he couldn't be sure what you meant by could. And he then invited you to unpack it in a bunch of different ways. You know, so the guy could have won the race, but the wind, if, if the wind hadn't blown or if he hadn't had so much to drink last night or if he tried harder, and I was a little surprised you didn't want to accept that invitation. You just sort of seemed to me say, well, we have a pretty good grip on this generally. And so a lot of our, it seems exactly right that unless you can understand what could is, you're not going to be able to have much confidence in any of these examples. But I wanted to just say that indecision, I think, also comes from a different source. So you talked about unwitting omissions and you used the word unwitting maybe you know, 20, 30 times. As far as I could tell, you didn't use the word advert. And in Michael's response, which purported to be about the same problem, he must have used the word advert or inadvert, inadvert tense, 20 or 30 times. And I'm also confused about what those terms mean. And without knowing more about that, I'm also unsure about what to say about some of these examples. And I wonder if inadvertence and whether unwittingness can both be unpacked entirely in terms of beliefs. And if not, then what do we mean? And if so, why don't we do that? Why don't we talk about terms we're a little more familiar with? If in fact you can be, if you can understand uh, unwittingness and inadvertence in terms of beliefs, then of course we're gonna have the problem of trying to figure out what the content of the belief is. These beliefs presumably have propositional content. It's gonna be very hard to know what the propositional content is in virtue of which someone is acting unwittingly or failing to act unwittingly or acting inadvertently. And so I suspect that that's also going to be a problem that's going to conceal difficulties in resolving some of these examples. Well, um, let's see, I think I did use advert once. Um, um, but, but yeah, uh, mostly, and, and I, I think I said at the beginning, so I, these are, um, the agents aren't aware, what I mean by calling the, the omissions unwitting, the agents aren't aware on the occasions in question that they aren't doing these, these things. Um, so I put it in terms of awareness, um, and maybe belief would be better. Um, uh, but so uh, Anne uh, isn't uh, aware uh, that she's um, uh, not um, uh, doing what she promised to do. Does that just mean believe, doesn't believe? Doesn't believe, yeah. Uh, well, does it, is it, uh, you know, I mean, 
I mean, I know your paper uh, talking about what, uh, you know, what, and um, uh, I think Michael and Heidi talk about this in some, uh, in, in some part of their paper too, um, that, you know, they're, they're sort of, um, well, you know, they're uh, a current beliefs and dispositional beliefs and there's, you know, there's sharp awareness and there's, well, I'm aware of it, but it's not the focus of my attention. Um, there are lots of different states here. Uh, and it's not clear exactly which ones are the relevant ones. Um, but um, it looks like in the cases I'm talking about, you, you haven't got any of these. You know, uh, uh, there isn't a dispositional belief. There isn't an occurrent belief. There is not a, you know, it's awareness but not focus of my attention. It's not the focus of attention. There's none of that. Um, um, so, um, but yet, there could and should have been all of that. Um, um, oh, go ahead. Hi, Kim Furzan. Um, I guess I'm able to beat the dead horse on the control um, and ability, so I thought I would. Um, so I just don't want to press on what you mean by sort of ability and control and, and get back to um, Carolina's question. So. Um, you know, assume that my child is currently choking uh, and I don't rescue him. And part of the reason I don't rescue him is because I don't know CPR and I don't know the Heimlich maneuver. And I'm going to make the claim, well, I wasn't able to rescue him, so you can't blame me. But the problem is, of course, I could have rescued him had I only taken the CPR class uh, two months ago. And it seems as though there are plenty of examples like that. If you only you'd taken swimming lessons, if only you hadn't been driving the lorry. Anne's car broke down, well, if only she'd taken the bus, she still would have gotten the milk. And it seems that for any case where you're going to press on control and ability, we can actually find some uh, possible world, or in most cases, we can find some possible world where the person could have accomplished it. And so really then, it's just a question of whether we think that there's something wrong about the fact that they didn't do that thing in that other possible world. But the could have and the ability isn't doing the work there. So, yeah, um, so that, that might be, uh, have been an earlier time uh, at which you were able to bring it about at the later time that you perform CPR. But, you know, what we might be interested in is at that later time, were you able to bring it about that you perform C CPR? Um, and if you, you know, if taking the lessons was required to have that ability and you didn't take the lessons, then at that later time, you don't have the ability. So we are able to acquire, uh, and we are able to, you know, um, 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 divest ourselves of, of abilities. Um, uh, abilities uh, change. Um, uh, let's see. Um, there are, um, yeah, I mean, there, there are possible worlds in which I do things that I don't have the ability to do. But, I mean, this just seems common sense. Uh, possible worlds in which, um, you know, I'm touching the moon right now, but I can't do it. Uh, I, but, I mean, you just seem to play with the frame, right? So with the parents, you always seem to say, well, they could have, when if you narrow the frame enough, they can't. And with the lorry driver, you seem to say he couldn't have, whereas if you broaden the frame, he could. So it's, it's just that you seem to, seem to switch back and forth in terms of what the could have is. And I'm just saying, gosh, I can push it really far, but we need an account of that, and then whether that's really doing the work. Uh, well, the claims about ability and, and capacity are doing work, right? Uh, and um, I don't think I'm playing with frames. I think I'm um, uh, speaking English, and that when we speak English, we express things, and we, we talk in English about abilities and capacities, um, and we're pretty good uh, at uh, attributing them and, um, and making judgments about them. Uh, and yes, it's an interesting philosophical project to say what they are. Uh, and I don't think, you know, it's very useful to talk about possible worlds. Uh, first of all, you know, what in the world are possible worlds? Um, I, I think we've got a much better grasp on what abilities and capacities are than we have on what possible worlds are. Um, 
uh, and I, I think you know most of the attempts to uh, cash out ability claims in terms of subjunctive conditionals um, run into you know run into walls. They're they're really bad problems. I'm, I, mean, I can run through some of the problems that I think there are for those kinds of accounts, but. Uh, I, I think there will any such account will every such attempt uh, always fail I don't claim that but I, I don't know of any account that's um, that's a very good one I don't know any counterfactual account of ability or uh, capacity or power claims in terms of counterfactuals that's very good um, I mean one I'll say this about what I think abilities and capacity capacities are I think there are species of powers uh, and I think powers are all you know everywhere in the world uh, their powers. Uh, electrons have powers uh, to uh, repel other like uh, other negative charged things and to attract things with mass. Um, uh, and uh, you know, then one might one might wonder, um, you know, well, uh, what's the what's the analysis of powers? Um, nobody's got a good analysis of powers, and it might be that that powers are fundamental. Um, I think it's, I think it's a good bet that they are. Uh, that there, things in the world are powerful. They've got powers. And uh, we're not electrons, so our powers aren't fundamental things in the world. Uh, we're, very, we're complex beings, and our powers are complex. And you know, so what, what their psychological and our agential powers are uh, quite complex powers. Um, but, and there's a lot that one can say to illuminate what powers are, but I, you know, I don't think uh, anybody's got anything close to a satisfactory analysis of them in terms of non-powers. Oh. Um, so I've been told that we're going to extend the Q&A, so number six. So I'm uh, hesitant to go um, uh, George's way on the, on the hot dog case and also definitely on the, um, similar, on the similar child in the back of the car case. Um, for, for the reason that it seems to me that the failure, uh, the responsibility in those cases can, can be grounded in the failure or deficiency of a, a standing disposition, psychological disposition, but it's not caring. Caring is the wrong place to look. I want to cite vigilance, and vigilance is something like just a constant attu attunement to, to the possibility of danger. And it's interesting, you know, animals have this, like mother bears famously. And um, maybe because we're complex creatures, it can fail in our case, but it seems to me from having had kids that just very early on in when the, when the kids are young, if there's some near miss or if the kid you know, has a, a small accident, at that point, you're vigilant, right? And I think this is what we expect of people. We constantly attuned to that sense of danger when it comes to kids, and maybe to dogs, maybe not in the case of milk. But so, um, um, so it seems to me that, that there is, you know, is going to be a, an explanation in the case of, of the kid, and maybe why the parent feels guilty is just because of the sense of a failure of vigilance, which is in one's voluntary control to a certain degree. One can attune oneself to be more or less vigilant. Yeah, good. Right, so um, it could be that uh, there was an, a failure to cultivate vigilance. And that, you know, so that kind of um, view of the, of the case would give us a, a tracing account of blameworthiness. Um, so what if there wasn't? Um, I mean, the person was vigilant generally to an ordinary extent, so there wasn't some failure to cultivate vigilance. Um, and um, so what do you, are you thinking that, well, there was a choice to lower vigilance in this case, or there was just a, fi uh, a failure to remain vigilant? Um, in the latter case, uh, it looks like we've got, an, I mean, presumably it was an unwitting uh, omission to be vigilant. Uh, uh, well, so like maybe we've traced the blameworthiness or if there is any responsibility for leaving the child in the car, maybe we've traced that back to uh, the failure to remain vigilant. Uh, but now we've traced it back to another unwitting omission. Unless you're thinking of it in terms I, I, of, a, I don't know say, a choice. So it seems to me that vigilance has to be robust, right? It has to be a very robust thing. So that, yeah, they're going to be excusing conditions, but we're not talking about excusing conditions here. We're talking about conditions that are non-excusing. Yeah. And so I'd like to see the case spelled out, a case in which we think that the vigilance is sufficiently strong or robust, and uh, there's no excusing condition, yet you want to um, uh, you know, blame in this case. So I'd like to see it. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to see it. I wonder if there is such a case. I mean, things that I think you gave us a schema for such a case, but I'd like to see it filled out. 
Right. I, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by the, the vigilance was. So the person was actually vigilant uh, to a sufficiently high degree. So the, so the person has on, standing, on this occasion. The general, the standing vigilant yeah, yeah. disposition. Okay. Okay. Right. The person wasn't vigilant enough in this particular instance, but there is no excuse in right. condition. So you got to explain to me how that. Right. Fill out right. the details of the case. Yeah. Right. Okay. So there was a, you know, an omission to remain vigilant, or. I mean, are you thinking of vigilance as a kind of mental action, kind of a, an attention? Yeah, it's kind yeah. of attention. Right, Constant right, attention. yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's difficult to think about mental actions and, you know, a responsibility for them, but um, so think of that. This is something that one can do intentionally. You, you said voluntarily. Um, uh, right. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, it seems to me that one but, can... But in this case, we have a failure to do it, right? Right. Um, Right, so that would be, but, and the agent could have done it? See, I don't, I don't think that the Or agent, no, I mean, I, if there's some reason to think that the agent couldn't have done it, then I think we've got an excusing circumstance, but, um, I, I mean, I wonder what, I want, what reason would there be to think the agent couldn't have been vigilant on this occasion? Couldn't have attended, uh, didn't attend, and maybe we can explain, maybe there's a causal explanation of didn't intend, but most causal explanations don't obviously yield the, uh, the implication couldn't have. They, they, they explain why not. Alright. So. Uh, final word will be number 10. Um, so, I Oh, sorry. I'm Gideon Yaffe. I didn't know what you were... Uh, um, I may have missed something, so you should just say that if that's the case. But I, there are these two abilities knocking around in your discussion of unwitting omissions, and they look... And I, I want to understand how you think of them as related and whether they equally bear on blameworthiness in those cases or what. So the one, the one ability is the ability to be aware that you're omitting, and the other is the ability to act. And the reason that this, these seem to me to be importantly different is because there's going to be lots of cases in which you have the ability to act, but there's no particular reason to think that you need the ability to be aware that you're not acting in order to have that. So there's, so, I mean, most of the actions that I perform, I don't precede them with the thought, I am not acting, and then engage in the action, right? I don't need to have the thought that I'm not acting in order to engage in the action. And so if I don't need to have the thought, it doesn't look like I need to have the ability to have the thought in order to have the ability to act. Um, so it, the reason that it seemed to me important was because it, it was one thing to say, here's why you're to be held responsible, because you could have done that thing. But, and I can sort of see why that would be an appealing position. But I'm a little less clear on why the fact that I could have been aware that I was omitting should in any way justify my responsibility <coughs> yeah, for good. the omission. Right. Well, right. So um, I do think it's kind of odd to think that um, you couldn't think to do the thing, but you could do the thing. Um, at least if, we, if what's at issue is what, could you have done it intentionally? Um, so actually that was, so you couldn't think to do it. You couldn't thing. think to do it. That's different but, from... But you could do it intentionally. That's a kind of odd. So, so actually, uh, 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 the claim that uh, the person had you know, satisfied Austin's all-in sense of can uh, could have uh, stopped for milk, could have removed the child from the car. Um, I think to cash that out, um, we, we need to... Uh, say also, well, could have thought to do that. Uh, so th uh, there's a, a cognitive requirement that's maybe part of the, the control condition. Um, if you can't think even to do a thing, now, I mean, an example of somebody who can't think to do a certain thing, a medieval knight can't think to search for an iPhone. So the idea, you know, we could, you know, give you, we could, you know, generate that capacity in him, but he doesn't have that capacity. Um, some people can't think to do certain things, um, and maybe certain sorts of, of Ill, mental illness um, uh, result in these kinds of incapacities. But uh, 
So generally, uh, an ability to intentionally do something requires a capacity to think to do it. That was, that was part of the claim. So, so actually, so this, this strikes me as something that began with, so Michael's, Michael's commentary began by suggesting, look, well, you're, the problem that you're trying to solve here isn't specific to omission. The problem that you're trying to solve has to do with, you're trying to understand how there can be responsibility in the unwitting cases somehow or inadvertence or something like that. that. And then, but actually it looks like the, the cognitive condition might be very different. Cognitive condition which you think is necessary and so you need to have the ability to satisfy it. It's the in, in the omission case, looks like it might be really different from the action case. So that is the way you put it here was, just now in response to me was, what you need to be able to do is to think to do it. Yeah. But I assume you, but in order to satisfy the control condition, yeah. And I was about to get to, in order to satisfy the cognitive condition. So, I mean, often the cognitive condition is stated in terms of um, your awareness with respect to the wrongness, or anyway, the moral uh, quality of what you're doing. Um, and uh, so I, I claim, well, in these cases, the person could have thought to do it and could have then realized that in not doing it, their conduct was wrong. Now, you're right that ordinarily, in order to be able to do something, you don't have to be able to think about, well, what would be the significance of my not doing it? Um, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's often thought in cases of negligent action, uh, that, uh, and, uh, and I'm saying it's also true in cases of unwitting omission, um, you know, there is not an awareness that one's conduct is wrong. There isn't actual awareness. Um, uh, so what could satisfaction of the cognitive requirement come to, and I say, uh, well, um, it was reasonable to expect that awareness. Um, and part of cashing that out is a claim, well, the person could have thought to do it and could have realized that in not doing it, their conduct was wrong. Or in the case of negligent action, um, could have thought to, um, to check before doing it. Could have realized that doing it without checking uh, risked wrongdoing. So that, that, that further um, bit about um, could have realized that the conduct was wrong uh, is part of satisfying the cognitive requirement for blameworthiness. Um, uh, oh. Okay, yeah, it, we're gonna move quickly to where the, whether that's a good requirement. Okay, so join me in thinking for So we'll